Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting and challenging one on the Book of Romans. We're calling this series Salvation by Faith Alone, the Book of Romans. And this is lesson number 12 in that series entitled Overcoming Evil with Good. It's the lesson for December 23, of 2017 and we wish you all a very Merry Christmas as you study this lesson. This lesson will focus on Romans 12 and 13 and we're going to ask you to bow your heads and pray with us as we begin. Our wonderful Father, once again we turn to the book of Romans to see what we can learn, to try to understand what it is you really want of us. May we see it clearly portrayed in this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in Romans 12 to 16 now, we're going to see Paul dealing with practical applications of the teachings that he taught from Romans 1, especially Romans 1 to 8, but even 9, 10, and 11 as well, and is talking about the Jews. We sometimes call that the place where the rubber meets the road. So, let's see. Many modern Christians suggest that all that is required for salvation is faith. Do you believe that? That depends how you define faith, wouldn't it? I knew somebody would raise that question. I mean, <laughs> and what you mean by salvation. Sure, yeah. exactly. Well, we remember the story of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16.31. Well, this is, under, this is true when understand, understood correctly. Paul made it very clear that faith works. Would you tell your physician, here's a good question, I'm a physician, I do this all day long. Would you tell your physician, I trust you, that is, I have faith in you. But just don't ask me to do too many things to get well. Guess how many patients I have that do that. If you follow your physician's instructions exactly, are you being a legalist? Does it depend on your motive? Yes. <laughs> doing it for merit or favor or whether you're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. How do I, how do I as a physician, motivate my patients? Hopefully they were motivated to, to take instruction from you. Or I hope they were somebody. motivated to get into the office to start out with. Right. Well, the man of faith may actually, in fact, work harder than the legalist. The difference is that instead of legalist, legalistically following a set of rules, as he chooses to interpret them, he follows God's guidance and sees the resulting transformation in his life. So what did Paul turn to first when talking about the practical applications of Christianity? Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time on these two verses, so look at it carefully. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is a true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God and what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. Okay, so Paul uses the word therefore, reminding us of what he had taught so far in Romans. And just very briefly, one, everyone is a sinner. God chooses to show his mercy to everyone who will accept it. Three, none of us can tell him what to do. Four, he does not owe us, any of us, anything. Five, the plan is his and his alone. Six, may he be praised. So what does that have to do with faith? Isn't God merciful to, to sinners? Yeah. I mean, that's the way he, way he is. It isn't something he does part-time. It's just the way he is. Mm -hmm. By faith, do we take advantage of God's gracious offer? Do we understand clearly what faith means? It means trusting God. God and, and trusting means you have, have to have a willingness to listen and take instruction. God wants us to, he wants to be our friend. 
Are we willing to accept God's plan for our lives? What, what would it mean, actually, to have God as a friend? Now, even the devil wanted to have God's power. He just didn't want to use it the way God wanted to use it. Well, Paul starts off by saying almost immediately that Christians should present their bodies as living sacrifices to God. Dead lambs and dead pigeons never were God's ideal. And you're all going to say, well, hold on, what about the Old Testament? God was trying to impress upon us through those Old Testament ceremonies the truth that sin leads to death. God first taught that at the, garden, at the gates of the Garden of Eden. In the Christian era, he is asking for living examples who are following the rules that Jesus laid down. So what's a living example? A living sacrifice? What is that? A person who dedicates themselves to following Jesus. Someone who actually makes an effort to follow Jesus. Yeah. Well, Paul suggested that in doing so, doing so is an act of reasonable service in the King James Version. What is reasonable service? That, it just Logic. Make, it just makes sense? Of course. Rational in the margin here, or spiritual service of worship in the text of the New American Standard. Okay, you're cheating here. <laughs> that's all right. No, you're, that, you're right. You want us to read the Bible. Yeah, there you go. Study. The word service is not the usual word for the service of a slave or even the service of a free man. Instead, it's the service of, the relig of a religious leader. It means religious service or worship. So the word logike, reasonable, is found in only one other place in the New Testament, and we have to go over there for you to understand it. Look at 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Be like newborn babies, always thirsty for the pure spiritual milk, so that by drinking it you may grow up and be saved. That word spiritual there is the same word logike. Hmm. So why would, why would those... Why would it be spiritual over here and over here it's logical? Well, the milk that Peter talked about in 1 Peter 2.2 2 is pure logike milk. It is spiritual milk. This is the word from which we derive our English word logical. So Paul was suggesting that when we come to the Lord, we should no longer bring dead pigeons or dead lambs, but that we bring our own lives ready to live in ways that are a tribute to God, and remember Matthew 5, 16, a form of real spiritual worship. So back in the olden days, during the Old Testament, it wasn't logical? That, um, well, that sacrifice wasn't logical? So well, today, now, it's a logical one? We, we need to ask ourselves, that's a fair question to ask, were they, if it's logical, it means they were, they were understanding what they were doing and it, they were learning from it. So, so as you read through the Old Testament, do you think they understood what they were doing and they were learning from it? Some may have been. May I read to you a passage that talks about that? Micah 6, starting with verse 6. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven? This is Old Testament. The God of heaven, when I come to worship him, Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Now that ought to really impress him, right? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just or righteous, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Is, is that, that reasonable? Is that a clue? That's as reasonable as you can be, yeah. Well, that's, that's really kind of good news, but is it reasonable? Mm -hmm. Or does God communicate through reasonable, which is logic? Well, yeah. I, I don't know if it's reasonable or not, because I don't know what it what takes. Else, what to, other means does God have, is, except to use logic? 
well, and, and that's true, but still, I don't know what the logic is to well, say here, that this is reasonable and this up here isn't. If I have a million um, sacrifices versus one. Well, let me give you a clue. Your brain, and you, whether you recognize this or not, it works with what we call a paradigm. It has a way of thinking about things. And if I try to say to you something which you've never heard before and it doesn't fit, you, you can't connect it with anything that's already in your brain, there's a 99% chance that very quickly you're going to forget it. Forget it or interpret it different? Well, that's another way of interpreting it differently. You, you may try to say, make it mean something completely different than what I intended. It just doesn't fit with what you want to. And the disciples are a perfect example of that. When Jesus kept saying to them, you know, I'm going to go up to Jerusalem. They're going to, I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. They're going to kill me. And the third day, I'm going to rise to life. Huh? What are you talking about? Well, let me say it again. Da, 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 da. Huh? We have evidence. That we have recorded in, in the Bible at least three and, and prefer possibly four times when Jesus said that to them. Hadn't a clue what he was talking about. It didn't fit with what they wanted to hear. Didn't fit their paradigm. No. Nope. So, so if they, if you're using your reasonableness mm -hmm. and your paradigm is different, well then you then going, you got a problem. Well, your reasonable, yeah, but we're just talking about your reasonable yeah. service. Mm -hmm. So. What if you have a different paradigm and you think your reasonable service is this way and you got a paradigm over here and your reasonable service is that way? So That's what happened to Paul in the Damascus Road. Yeah, that's true. Well, this worship is rational, intelligent, and reasonable. The New English Bible suggests that it is a worship offered by mind and heart. Do we, do we recognize God's real worth? No doubt Paul was addressing the Gnostics of his day. What do we know about Gnostics? Well, remember the Gnostics taught that anything, they, they, in their minds there was a very big divide between what was spiritual and what was practical or, 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 or material. Material, I guess that's probably the better word. Anything that was material, if you could touch the table, you could touch a computer, you could touch another person, those things are all evil. Anything that's spiritual is, is untouchable. It's, it's, and you know, and, and it's good. That's the good. All this stuff is evil. Well, Paul is saying, let me tell you a little secret, folks. Christianity has to do with the dirt and grime of everyday living. If your religion does not impact everything you do, it is not a true religion. Our service to God is not a means of appeasing his wrath or somehow a payment for our sins. It is a way of life not just a weekly service in a church somewhere. The Gnostics had a religion of profession and claims, but no action. In fact, some of them thought, well, because this body of mine is completely evil anyway, there's nothing I can do about that. I will just worship God with my spirit, and then I can do whatever I want with my body. I can commit adultery. I can do whatever I want, because it's evil anyway. Well, all through the Old Testament, the prophets had taught that again and again. I just read you Micah 6, 6 to 8, Amos 5, 18 to 27, Isaiah 1, 2 to 20. Even David in the 51st Psalm stated forcefully that what God wants is true, intelligent, thinking, rational, religious service. No more dead pigeons, please. Through Christ's death, we have already had the ultimate demonstration of the fact that sin leads to death. We do not need daily or weekly deaths of lambs to remind us. Well, here's a comment from our Bible study guide. What this means is that works are part of the Christian faith. Paul never meant to depreciate works. In chapters 13 to 15, that's Romans, he gives, gives them strong emphasis. This is no denial of what he has said earlier about righteousness by faith. On the contrary, works are the true expression of what it means to live by faith. One could even argue that because of the added revelation after Jesus came, 
the New Testament requirements are more difficult than what was required in the Old. Well, in the Old we have the Ten Commandments, in the New we have Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which is harder to, to, to follow. And I don't think you have to read very far to figure that one out. New Testament believers have been given an example of proper moral behavior in Jesus Christ. He and no one else shows the pattern we are to follow. Let this mind be in you, which was also in, not Moses, not Daniel, not David, not Solomon, not Enoch, not Deborah, not Elijah, Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.5 The standard doesn't, can't, get any higher than that. I know, that's in your Bible study guide for December 16. Well, let me ask you a question. You out there in your Sabbath school, what would you do if Jesus suddenly opened the back door and entered your class? If he sat down at the front, would we ask some of our class members to rush out and gather some large stones to make an altar while others gathered sticks to burn the offering and someone else could catch some pigeons so we could sacrifice to him? You'd probably say, man, haven't you learned anything yet? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't even come to mind for me. I don't yeah. know why you, why, where you're getting that from. <laughs> we, 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 well, we, why would you, why would, we, Holly's text said, well, I don't want sacrifices. But we're gonna, now we're going to offer sacrifices for what? Well, was it, the logic? Just, if, if, if that had happened in the Old Testament, was that what people would have done? Well, they didn't, do, apparently didn't do much of that when he was around. No. But you're talking about New Testament now. Well, well, they, when, still when had, they still had the, what we call the Old Testament books. Uh, we didn't get yeah. any of the New Testament until about, what, 30 or 40 years later? Paul was telling us that God wants us to come before him in our best possible condition, not falling asleep because we have been working so hard all week without adequate sleep or a good, or a good diet, not dozing because we ate too much for breakfast or because the pastor is boring because there's nothing important to say. Oh dear, did I say that? So what kind of a person is God? Do you think that impacts on what he wants of us? Sure. What, what, what do you think Jesus meant and how was that understood when he said to that woman in Samaria, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 24. God is what, spirit. What does that mean? Not material. Okay. He's outside He's just, of the realm of material. Yeah. But the Son seems to be, he came down as a man, so... Um, Very real. He's the source of everything. Okay, well, Jesus was clearly intelligent, thinking, and a rational being. What kind of worship would such a being want from his children, even his friends? All he really wants is people to listen and take instruction. You go through the Old Testament, he says, you people aren't listening, you won't take the instruction. Jesus said in John 15, 15, I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I've heard from my father. There he is. He's a teacher, yeah. not a penalty payer. And if you go back to Isaiah 1, verse 18, the Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you'll be as white as wool. Now it says, let's settle the matter in my translation. The King James says, come now and let us reason together. So you don't, you don't reason with a metal god. You don't reason with a stone god, a, a wooden god. We were, we, we're, we're dealing with an intelligent god, the most intelligent being in the universe. Well, and so God asks us to come. He wants our minds to be sharp and clear, seeking to understand things the best we possibly can. Well, it's very interesting that after reading, after quoting Romans 12, 1, Ellen White said, men then can make their bodies unholy by sinful indulgences. If unholy, they are unfitted to be spiritual worshipers and are not worthy of heaven. 
if man will cherish the light that God and mercy gives him upon health reform, <laughs> he may be sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. But if he disregards that light and lives in violation of natural law, he must pay the penalty. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 162. So what does health reform have to do with thinking, intelligent, spiritual worship? Notice that even though she had no knowledge of Greek, Ellen White understood this verse absolutely correctly. In fact, Dr. Maxwell used to tell us that there, he had a list of 24 verses in the Bible where Ellen White, without knowing the Greek, where the King James had it wrong, she interpreted it correctly. I wonder how she did that. Hmm. Here's an example. Well, God wants us to come to worship Him and to speak with Him in the best condition possible. He knows, as we should know, the best way to care for our bodies. Are we willing to accept His directions by avoiding health-destroying practices such as smoking, drinking, alcohol, overeating, or eating unhealthy foods? Do those things help us to understand God better? In order to give God the best possible service, we should be in the healthiest condition possible. And I can tell you, I sometimes I have thought, I'm sure this is not 100% true, but it, it sure seemed like it sometimes. I, I can tell almost when I first walk into a patient's room if they used to be or still are a drug user. Certainly if there's, I can tell across the room if a person has been a long-term cigarette smoker. Well, contrast this kind of service with the kind of worship Egyptians gave to crocodiles. We're talking about this intelligent spiritual worship. Would you give a crocodile an intelligent spiritual worship? Flies? Beetles? Would a fly ex expect intelligent worship? Many of the ancient Egyptians were subsistence farmers. Let's try to understand their situation. Their very lives depended upon the reproductive capacity of their crops and animals. Those creatures that they worshipped were worshipped because they were very fertile. Well, let's ask some very practical, but, but really very tough questions now. When a visitor comes to one of our classes, or even to one of our church services, what does she or he see? Is she or he impressed by the intelligent, rational approach we take to our God? Do our church services seem a lot, like a lot of mumbo-jumbo? Is there a lot of repetition? Does God appreciate repetition? Pagans often try to impress their gods by repetition. You know, they, the Sherpas used to put those little wheels, connect them to the stream of water, and so it just keeps going around. And the idea is every time the, the prayer goes around, it ascends to heaven. And so think of all the prayers you're offering. Is that well, the way I... In a limited supply, uh, repetition denotes emphasis. Okay. okay. Verily, Fair verily, I say it to you. You know, Fair enough. repeats that or as says further on there in Revelation, holy, 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 uh, the living creatures say. So. Yeah. Well, vi when visitors come in to, to a Sabbath school, how will they be impressed? You're asking these questions. What, what would they, what would we see that would impress them? Well, if God was asking for intelligent spiritual worship, and then our Sabbath school classes should be a time for asking questions. There ought to be a lively exchange. People should have studied their lessons. They should come prepared and say, you know, what does this mean? Why are we studying this? And the person should go home saying, well, I just learned something. Well, that would be great, but sometimes it's the teacher that keeps that from happening. Well, very often that's true. <laughs> Well, in, in Revelation 4, 8 to 10, it talks about angels who cry all day long, holy, holy, holy. Does God get tired of hearing that? Well, it's a symbolic book, and, and that's, uh, that's the symbolism in that passage in chapters 5 and 
four and five may represent something, but I don't know if that's, you know, is, okay. is there this... You're being pretty literal, aren't you? By even I'm, I'm asking a question. question. I'm asking yeah, you a question. That's his answer then. And okay. You're being a little too literal here. Okay. Well, well here's another literal. It says they cast their thrones at the feet of Jesus. Does he have a huge stack of thrones? Uh, I'm sorry, oh. cast their crowns. Does he have a huge stack of crowns sitting in front of him? Do they ever go pick them up again? Well, how literal do you take that? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, if, if, if we have those kind of pictures in our, if we talk about things like that, do we just assume that a visitor will understand? Or do we try to explain? We, are we making our lessons intelligent, understandable, attractive? Well, let's go to Romans 12, verse 2, while you're thinking about that. Do we really need to understand the meaning? Do not, this is Romans 12, 2, my good news translation. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you, notice that word, inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. Okay? What do we learn there? Well, that word transform comes from the Greek word metamorphosis. Now, those of you who have studied biology at some point in time know the word metamorphosis. What happens in metamorphosis? Change from one form Changes, to another. Yeah. And can you give an example? Caterpillar. A caterpillar turns into a butterfly. I mean, and I've had fun sometime going, in fact, I not too long ago visited um, Costa Rica, and there was a place there where they had a whole big old board with with um, the, the 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 chrysalis. Not not this would not be the the caterpillars themselves, but the crystalli that they came from, and then the butterflies. And there is no way you could look at those, you know, even though that's where the butterfly came right out of, that you could know that oh yeah that belongs to that one, that one belongs to that one. That, no way. Unless you've seen it many times before. Yeah, well, you can learn by, by, by practice, yes, by observation. You wouldn't be able to predict if no. you didn't know. So, does God expect that kind of radical change in us? We must be born again. Is that transformation obvious to people around us? Do we demonstrate what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Well, that should be the goal. That should be the goal. The word prove in this verse is the Greek word for testing. Look at a couple of other verses where it's used. First Thessalonians 5:21, put all things to the test, keep what is good. Okay? And look at 1 John 4:1. This is something we don't do very often. My dear friends, do not believe all who claim to have the Spirit, but test them to find out if the Spirit they have comes from God. Do we know how to test someone to see if their Spirit comes from God? Is that what Solomon did? Did he, did he do a lot of testing? Well, Solomon did a lot of testing of natural things. That's what you're thinking of, or you think of? Well, he found out what was good and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. So, Christians are expected to have well-disciplined minds, minds that have been sharpened and matured by thinking about God, trying to understand the scriptures and living lives of purity and self-control. How does the media today picture religious people? Depends who the producer is. <laughs> well, <laughs> most of them are uniform. Usually, religious people are pictured as bigots, dumb. Where did they get that idea? Well, there's some out there like that. <laughs> so they'll, they'll pick and those and extrapolate from there. And there are, there's a devil out there who wants you to think that every Christian is like that. Well, in the, in the Bible, the will of God is revealed. The truths of the Word of God, and I'm reading, this is from Ellen White, this is from Review and Herald, December 18, 1913, or in the book My Life Today, 
page 24, Mind, Character, and Personality, 447. In the Bible, the will of God is revealed. The truths of the Word of God are the utterances of the Most High. He who makes these truths a part of his life becomes in every sense a new creature. He is not given new mental powers, but the darkness that through ignorance and sin has clouded the understanding is removed. The words, a new heart also I will give, will I give you, mean a new mind will I give you. So that's, she's straightforward on that. A change of heart is always attended by a clear conviction of the Christian duty, an understanding of truth. He who gives the scriptures close prayerful attention will gain clear uh, comprehension and sound judgment as if, as if in turning to God he had reached a higher plane of intelligence. Wow. A higher plane of intelligence. How does that happen? Connection with the, yeah. the things that are unseen through Scripture. Do our minds work better if we struggle with the truths of Scripture? Mm -hmm. that's you don't have the quote, I think, but she talks about how. That, that's exercise, yeah. Well, so how, uh, is everything that is said of religious nature at church, at Sabbath school, or on TV perfectly clear and obviously true? Yeah. Everything we say in this group, obviously true, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Why do so many religious leaders ask us just to accept things by faith? Is that an intelligent, rational approach? Keeps you from proving things, go yeah. through the work. Who would, who would lose if we demanded a careful investigation of the truth? Satan would lose every time. The truth is always on God's side, never on the devil's side. And Ellen White says, in Councils to Writers and Editors, page 35, there is no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there is no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of Scripture are without an error. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not a proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth, and truth can afford to be fair. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. So is she Do we know anybody who does that? Do you think she's talking about herself, too? Yes. So even... Some of the things she said. She says not, everything. Maybe, you, everything you read, study. But but you're pretty confident that anything you read from Ellen White is going to true, prove out true. I. Uh, there are things e things that can easily be twisted, just as there are in the Bible, to well, I know to be that, misunderstood. But, but you yeah. do believe that anything you investigate. With I Ellen think White that says, Ellen White was a. Uh, inspired prophet of God, and I take her writings in toto as being inspired. In toto? Yes. Toto? Okay. The subjects, I'm, she goes on another place, the subjects which we present to the world must, must be to us a living reality. It's hard to present something with conviction if you don't believe in it yourself. It is important that, I'm reading on, it is important that in defending the doctrines which we consider fundamental articles of our faith, we should never allow ourselves to play arguments that are not wholly sound. Have you ever heard an evangelist use an argument that you knew was not valid? These may avail to silence an opposer, but they do not honor the truth. We should present sound arguments that will not only silence our opponents, but will bear the closest and most searching scrutiny. Gospel Workers 299, Evangelism 166. If every idea we have entertained in doctrines is true, will not the truth bear to be investigated? Will it totter and fall if criticized? If so, let it fall and the sooner the better. Now there's an intellectual Christian. The spirit that would close the door to investigation points, uh, investigation of points of truth in a Christ-like manner is not the spirit from above. Some have feared that if even a single point they acknowledge themselves, in, that in a, even a single point they acknowledge themselves in error, other minds would be led to doubt the whole theory of truth. 
Therefore, they have felt that investigation should not be permitted, that it would tend to dissension and, and disunion. But if such is to be the result of investigation, the sooner it comes, the better. If there are those whose faith in God's Word will not stand the test of an investigation of the Scriptures, the sooner they are revealed, the better. For then the way will be open to show them their error. We cannot hold that a position once taken, an idea once advocated, is not under any circumstances to be relinquished. There is but one who is infallible, he who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. And yes. is prophet. Well, that, that's assuming we're assuming that the prophets speak for him. But you assume that Ellen White speaks for him. Yeah. So, so that's, well, obviously you do. <laughs> yeah. Well, as Adventists, we believe the time is coming when the devil will exert maximum effort to deceive, misrepresent, and challenge everything God says. Are we prepared for that? Will we be ready to stand firm, tall, and straight to face the devil with clear, convincing arguments, proving that his statements are not according to Scripture? Can you imagine yourself facing the devil <coughs> and say that's a, saying that's a lie? Especially when he says that he's God or an mm -hmm. angel of God. Are we absolutely dedicated to discovering and teaching the truth as an act of worship? There is nothing that God wants more. And here's a very challenging comment from Ellen White. She was, she, a, a group of people came to her and they said they had found this person who had was receiving visions and so forth like this, and she reviewed what was said, and this is what, her comment. I am afraid of anything that would have a tendency to turn the mind away from the solid evidences of the truth as revealed in God's Word. I am afraid of it. I am afraid of it. We must bring our minds within the bounds of reason, lest the enemy so come in as to set everything in a disorderly way. How much of religion as it's usually presented is solid, built on solid evidence, and, and how, how many pastors ask this, their parishioners to go home and, and challenge what they have just heard? Well, is, you know, there's a couple of very interesting passages. Let me read a couple of them. Look at Hebrews 5, 14 to 6-3. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice, and I guess I should back up to verse 11. There is much we have to say about this, but it is hard to explain to you because you are so slow to understand. There has been enough time for you to be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God, of the teaching about baptisms and laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Let us go forward and this is what we will do if God allows. What does that suggest? We have some growth to do. Some growing to do. Well, look at, look at Ephesians 4, see how this compares. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service. In other words, everybody's supposed to be doing what? Christian service. In order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children. I thought we were supposed to be like little children. 
We shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is ahead. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Have you ever belonged to a church where that happens? And you remember the famous passage from Peter, are we doing this, 1 Peter 3.15, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you. Are you out there? Are you prepared to do that? And those of us here, are we prepared to do that? Well, Martin Luther commented on Romans 12, verse 2. We've read quite a bit of Ellen White's comments. He commented on it as well. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2. In this way, the apostle describes Christian progress, for he addresses those who already are Christians. The Christian life does not mean to stand still, but to move from that which is good to that which is better. Martin Luther, Commentary on Romans 167 and 168. Well, in Paul's day, many of the pagan religions and the mystery religions got their spirits out, out of a bottle, more or more likely, out of a goat skin. So what kind of spirits was that? Alcohol. Okay, yeah. Alcohol. Paul made it very clear that such was not God's plan for his followers. True health reform is never legalistic. God just wants us to be in the healthiest condition possible, and so he gives us instructions to that end. How many Seventh-day Adventists do you know who are really doing everything they can to be as healthy as possible? Some of them go overboard. Well, okay. <laughs> Romans 12, starting with verse 3 to 8. And because of God's gracious gift to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking and judge yourself according to the amount of faith that God has given you. We have many parts in, in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it according to the faith he that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. That's pretty clear instructions, right? So if our minds are clear and we are thinking intelligently, we would recognize that there is nothing for which we have reason to be proud. Every person in the Christian community has been given gifts. These gifts are from God and are to be used for the benefit, for the betterment of the whole community. In the process of salvation, many seem to believe that we just need to surrender to the Holy Spirit. But is there anything for us to do? Well, this is a very interesting passage found in, this is in Signs of the Times, December 24, uh, 28, 1891. It's also found in Healthful Living, page 304, paragraph 5. Your energies are required to cooperate with God. Your energies are required to cooperate with God. Without this, if it were possible to force upon you with a hundredfold greater intensity the influence of the Spirit of God, it would not make you a Christian a fit subject for heaven. What does that mean? God can't force you to make a decision. God, and he, but potentially he could, but he certainly won't. He can't. It's, it's within, contrary to his character. Yeah, so exactly. So we define his character as love, and there's no force, coercion, extortion, deception, greed involved in God. Yep. The stronghold of Satan would not be broken. There must be the willing and the doing on the part of the receiver. Um, 
there must be an action. Representatives coming out from the world and being separate. There must be a doing of the words of Christ. The soul must be emptied of self that Christ may pour his spirit into the vacuum. Christ must be chosen as a heavenly guest. The will must be placed on the side of God's will. Then there is a new heart and a new holy resolve. A new holy resolves, I'm sorry. It is Jesus enthroned in the soul that makes every action easy in his service. Signs of the Time, December 20, 1891. So what is our part? What do we need to do? Love one another. Well, we first of all need to open our minds as we study the Bible and allow the Holy Spirit to work with us in an intelligent way. I mean, so, so then we know how to reach out to others. Do we need to understand why God has done what he did? Is that important? Well, Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, and then I'll raise you on the last day and eternal life to know the Father and... Mm -hmm. uh, and Jesus who, who he must send. Yeah. And if, if we're doing all of that to obtain salvation or eternal life, well, he's spelled it out as a rather small uh, uh, formula. Yeah. Well, do we need to ask questions like, why did God send a flood? Do we need to ask why the firstborn in Egypt died? If we have real faith, do we ask more questions or fewer questions? If faith is an intelligent relationship with Jesus Christ, do we need to ask questions? Mm -hmm. We don't have questions, we won't see the answers. If a teacher is in, sit, standing in front of a classroom and makes a whole presentation and nobody asks any questions, what does he think? I didn't they didn't get job. it. Either he did the perfect job or they didn't get it. <laughs> well, there's always well, more. Yeah, because we know in part and prophesy in part. So, so how would how would how should we pray to an intelligent God? Do we talk to him as we would talk to a friend? So we've been told. Makes Jesus, sense. Jesus taught us to pray, our, our Father, Father, so forth and so on. Yeah. When you talk to a friend, do you just say? Um, you know, I had a nice day today. I wish God would bless the call porters and the missionaries. Uh, oh, by the way, I need this and this and this. And thanks for talking to you. Bye. How long would that friendship last? You have to be willing to listen. Yeah. I remember once I did a prayer that I told God a joke and somebody thought that was terrible. Mm-hmm. In a public prayer. Yeah, w with a group of people. Yeah. And um, it was a joke for everybody, plus God, mm -hmm. you know, and, and didn't think there was a place for that. So I guess we have to be formal with God all the well, time. Well, and there's, there's all kinds of things. There are a lot of people who think, well, I know of a lot of people, but there are some people who think you, you can't pray unless you kneel down. Well, that's... That would never work for me. I have to pray all day long with everything I do. All you have to do is walk around kneeling all the time, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, Christians will also be humble. This is a comment from our um, Bible study guide. Paul here shows how that love is to be expressed in a practical manner. One important principle comes through, and that is personal humility a willingness of a person not to think of himself more highly than he ought, Romans 12.3, a willingness to give preference to one another in honor, Romans 12.10, and a willingness not to be wise in your own opinion, Romans 12.16. Christ's words about himself, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, catch the essence of it. That's the lesson for December 18. Well, Romans 13.1-7 you're all familiar with, I think, somewhat, but let's just, I think we can have time to read this. Everyone must obey the state authorities because no authority exists without God's permission, and the existing authorities have been put there by God. Whoever opposes the existing authority opposes what God has ordered, and anyone who does so will bring judgment upon himself. So no matter what government you live under, it's God's will, right? 
But does that mean that Donald Trump is with God's? Well, let's not well, make not it quite that. so. How about if you lived in Germany when Adolf Hitler yeah. came or in? Stalin or Stalin in Russia, so forth. You know, sometimes I wonder if what motivated him to, to say that. Was there some problem he had to deal with? Hitler? No, I mean, I well, mean Paul oh, oh, during yeah. his time. Because that was a corrupt. Yeah. Well, whoever opposes the existing authority opposes what God has ordered, and anyone who does so will bring judgment upon himself. For rulers are not to be feared by those who do good, but by those who do evil. Would you like to be unafraid of those in authority? Then do what is good, and they will praise you, because they are God's servants working for your own good. But if you're evil, then be afraid of them, because their power to punish is real. They are God's servants and carry out God's punishment on those who do evil. For this reason, you must obey the authorities, and not just because of God's punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. There is also this, that is also why you pay, we pay taxes. Why you pay taxes? Because the authorities are, are working for God when they fulfill their duties. Pay then what you owe them. Pay them your personal and property taxes, and show respect and honor for them all. Well, what kind of government did Paul live under? The one that cut off his head. The one that ended up cutting off his head. Well, I, you kind of wonder if you paid your taxes grudgingly and, and, and argumentatively, if that was be a good Christian um, attitude right there. If, how could you tell anybody anything when you start doing that kind of thing. Paul goes on to say we should be live in peace with all around us. Christians who are constantly stirring the pot will not have time to focus on what is most important. Yet we know that at the end of time, laws will be passed, making it illegal to be a faithful Seventh-day Adventist. What should we do then? The advice of Peter is still valid. We ought to obey God rather than man. And I quote, we are to recognize human government as an ordinance of the divine appointment and teach obedience to it as a sacred duty without, within its legitimate sphere. But when its claims conflict with the claims of God, we must obey God rather than men. God's word must be recognized as above all human legislation. We are not required to defy authorities. Our words, whether spoken or written, should be carefully considered lest we place ourselves on record as uttering uh, that which would make us appear antagonistic to law and order. We are not to say or do anything that would unnecessarily close up our way. Acts of the Apostles 69. Well, going on, the question of how we are to be good citizens and good Christians can be very complicated at times. If someone were to come to you seeking advice about standing for what he or she believes was God's will, even though it would be put him, in, him or her in conflict with the government, what would you say? This is our adult Bible study guide. Would you dare today in our day tell someone you, 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 you should deny what the government says? There's certainly lots of people who are doing that. You mean because they're not telling the truth? Or because it's their command? Well, Presumably, it's because you see a conflict between what God tells you and what the government tells you. Is that... Well, that, there could be a lot of variances and, and gray areas right there, do exactly. you think? Yeah. Why is this something we should proceed toward only with the utmost seriousness and prayerful consideration? After all, not everyone thrown into the lion's den emerges as unscathed. Well, then there's those famous verses found in Romans 13, 8 to 10. Be, be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not desire what belongs to someone else. All these and any others besides are summed up in the one command, love your neighbors, love yourself. If you love someone, you will never do them wrong. To love, then, is to obey the whole law. Well, some are, 
there's some of the commandments being mentioned there, but they're not all mentioned. Does that mean these are the only ones that are important? Many of our Christian friends take this verse to suggest that especially the Sabbath commandment is no longer binding on Christians. Is that what Paul was trying to say? What was Jesus suggesting when he said that love to God and love to our fellow men are the two great commandments, Matthew 22? Jesus also just suggested that we should render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, Matthew 22 later on, same chapter. Are we doing that? Are we putting God first in all that we do? Which commands did Paul cite as examples that illustrate the principle of love and law keeping? Why these in particular? Any idea why Paul chose the commands that he chose? Well, they're uh, towards other people, you know, other people, and then he sums up, he says, if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he's not being exclusive. He's saying there are other commandments that we could bring into this, but uh, it's summed up in, in loving your neighbor. Okay. You must do this because you know that the time has come, the next verse, for you to wake up from your sleep, for the moment when we will be saved is closer now than it was when we first believed. That is certainly true. We're talking about 2,000 years later. And we're and more than 170 years after the great disappointment. Are we, have we been crying wolf, wolf so long about the second coming that people just pass us off? Was Paul wrong when he said we were close to the second coming? Well, here's Ellen White's words as we're running out of time. The Lord is soon coming, and we must be ready and waiting for his appearing. Oh, how glorious it will be to see him and be welcomed as his redeemed ones. Long have we waited, but our hope is not to grow dim. If we can but see the king in his beauty, we shall be forever blessed. I feel as if I must cry aloud, homeward bound. We are nearing the time when Christ will come in power and in great glory to take his ransomed ones to their eternal home. Although Paul doesn't deal much with the second coming in uh, Romans here, he does in, in um, Thessalonian and the Corinthian letters. If you knew for certain that Jesus was coming next month, what would you change in your life and why? If you, um, if you believe you need to change these things a month before Jesus comes, shouldn't we make that change now? What is the difference? Our kind and loving Father, we consider it a great privilege to become your learners, your children, your heirs, as you've, you've promised us. We approach this challenge with great humility, realizing it's not going to be an easy thing, and with trembling and, and, and trepidation in respect to what's coming between now and your second coming. We know the devil will do everything possible to deceive even the elect. May we be prepared by having studied your word and come to know you very well and to have becoming, become your friends, to stand up and face the devil himself and say, no, you're wrong. May that be the experience of all those also who are listening today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.